I met this girl about seven years ago, right at the beginning. Things were a little difficult since whenever I tried to get out with my friends, she freaked out. It was challenging. Not gonna lie. But as time passed, she mellowed and got over her dread of me being away from her. What's the downside? I kind of drifted apart from my pals. They all embarked on the path of starting families, living the suburbia ideal with children, and the live, laugh, love motto emblazoned on their walls, U.S. Now we were on a different wavelength. We didn't see children in our future. Instead, we had huge plans to travel the world, immersing ourselves in different cultures, experiencing strange delicacies, and simply living our best lives together. It felt like it was us versus the world, you know? But then, a year into our globe trip, I discover she's having an affair. Classic, right? She started acting strangely and distant. Then she struck me with the I need some space phrase and I absolutely trust her. I gave her what she asked for. She thought she just needed some time to think things through. But here's a twist. Her concept of space was to get cozy with a guy she worked with. Something about the situation did not sit well with me, and I did something I am not very proud of. One sleepless night. Curiosity got the better of me, and I ended up peeking at her phone. And, well, the writing and photographs said it all. I didn't create a scene. I just gently removed my wedding ring, placed it on top of her phone as a silent statement that I knew everything, and walked away. Then she burst into tears and apologized profusely. She tried to dismiss it as a dumb error, but I wasn't about to let that slip. Falling into bed with someone else is not something you do casually. Oops, this has been going on for quite a while. This was not a mistake made at random. And when she tried to tell me it was over and she was no longer seeing him, I had to call her out. She threw away everything we had for a fling that ended just as fast. That didn't merely make her conduct wrong, this made her behavior even more frustrating. So she's still hanging out with the guy, and now she's all about fixing us, even considering going to therapy for herself. But here's the deal. I told her straight out that no matter what we did, I would never trust her again. It is not occurring. Not now. Not for a decade. Then she sends me this text about having to work late due to a major anxiety attack at work. Anxiety? Really? No, that won't fly with me. Now she's looking for a new place, which is difficult to find around here. So we're sort of stuck in this odd holding pattern, waiting for her to find a place that won't break the bank. Our current location? Yeah, it's way out of her financial range. We want to get divorced as soon as possible, but we're still waiting for the official marriage documents to arrive. Talk about a slow pace. So here I am, practically riding solo with my family, living on the other side of the world, and attempting to manage this mess. It's just me and the cats now. I'm chilling while my almost ex is out there having her best life. And regarding this other guy, he's someone she met at her new job. They appear to be a bad match, right? A cheater and a dude. Okay, what about being involved with someone who is married? Honestly, I have much too much self-esteem to be concerned about what she's up to. Many people have been really encouraging, telling me that I handled this horrific circumstance admirably. They are all about telling me that going away was the greatest decision. They're like, even if she suddenly transformed into the most amazing partner, their trust is gone. They tell me I'm avoiding a bullet, sparing myself a lot of sorrow and lost time, and that I'll be able to cut her out and move on soon. They say that things will only get better from here. Everyone agrees that I should focus on healing with her. Still around. That will be a little difficult. They advise that if her name is not on the list, I should try to persuade her to move out as soon as possible. Perhaps she can bunk with her fair pal, the one she thought was worth ending our marriage for. If you are in a situation where you cannot simply pack up and leave, it appears that you are opting for what is known as living together. But it's not like you're giving each other the quiet treatment, but in a relaxed way. And it sounds like you're really adept at keeping it cool, like a gray rock. It's wise to get yourself checked out in terms of health and consult with a lawyer to ensure you're all set, and completely. It wouldn't be unexpected if she tries to swoop back in, believing that everything would return to normal. It's unfortunate that both of your names are on the lease, making the whole you-need-to-leave conversation a little awkward, but hey, you're handling it like a pro by keeping to yourself and all. You've even transformed the living room into your new crash pad, replete with a new mattress. Because honestly, 
Who wants to sleep in that bed after everything that's happened? So she's now confined to the bedroom, attempting to be ninja-like by sneaking in without making a scene. She doesn't seem to be at home very often these days, only popping in a few days a week, which seems like a relief. Gives you some space to reflect and plan your next steps. You're just counting down the days until she hands you her key and you can reset your life, and of her attempt to mend things. You've already decided that's a no-go. If love was real, she would not have put you through this ordeal. No way. You are letting her off the hook. Cheating is not an accident. It is a decision. And her return, begging and pleading, was only because she was caught red-handed, not because she sincerely apologized. Clearly, she's not interested in making things right for the long haul. Any solutions she proposes are like to placing a band-aid on a shattered leg. Plus, you can tell she's starting to grow jealous of you, and hanging out with your friends was a huge red flag from the start. She has insecurities. Yes, they effectively derailed whatever you two were working on. So what are your thoughts on all this? Do you believe those anxieties can drive someone to cheat? Leave your two cents in the comments. Let's talk about it. The next story has a cheater who keeps his friends too close for comfort. Okay, let's go into this problem with my ex, Tyler, and his much too close for comfort friendship with his bestie, Lily. Imagine this. They're so close that everyone assumes they're a couple. When it came to important occasions, Tyler went above and beyond with my gifs. He preferred Lily, especially on her birthdays. So there's only one day, right? One of Tyler's co-workers rushes at me, agitated, accusing me of flirting with Tyler, believing he is Lily's guy. I literally had to whip out my phone and look through photos of Tyler and me just to prove to him that yes, I am the girlfriend. I've brought this up with Tyler several times, telling him how strange and uncomfortable it makes me feel. But Tyler just blows it off every time, saying Lily is nearly family and I'm exaggerating. Then there is our anniversary. I was ecstatic because a friend of mine who knows everything about travel offers had set us up with this fantastic weekend break at a resort, I tell Tyler, and he appears excited at first, but hear this. About a week before our scheduled departure, Tyler smacks me with, Hey, can I bring Lily instead? She's been feeling low and may really benefit from the trip. I'm standing there, jaw on the floor, thinking, Are you serious? Do you want to leave me on our anniversary for another girl? Tyler just loses it, calls me awful names, and talks about how Lily needs him right now. When I inform him it isn't going to happen, he loses interest in the trip and simply leaves. We go three days without talking, and that is pretty much the end of our relationship. I'm in tears as I tell my best friend about the whole split and how I don't have enough money for the trip. And she says, Why don't we just go have fun ourselves? So we do. Not barely an hour after we checked in, the front desk called to inform me that my reservation had been mixed up. I look down. And who am I seeing? Tyler and Lily. Tyler charges at me, enraged, yelling about how I shouldn't be there, and that Lily deserves this vacation far more. So there we were at the resort, correct? And Lily simply breaks down, sits in a chair, and starts crying like a river. She's all about relaxing this weekend and forgetting about how messed up her life has gotten. Meanwhile, Tyler is losing it. There was a lot of yelling and Lily is simply there. Tears flowed. She's caught up in her own drama. Due of the chaos, security had to intervene. And the next thing you know, they're being instructed to pack up and leave the following morning. Then, as if the resort drama wasn't enough, Tyler decided to make his relationship with Lily official on Facebook. But this is when things become funny. My crew and family aren't the kind to attend a show without eating some popcorn. They flood his post with comments, asking if they are siblings and making Sweet Home Alabama analogies, because let's be honest, it seemed too near for comfort. Tyler attempted everything he could to stop the gossip train, but it was already in full swing. Fast forward three months, and while the talk has subsided, their reputations have undoubtedly suffered, and I can't help but feel a sense of joy about it. Everyone's reactions have been gold. Comments such as, glad he's your ex, and what a duo of dummies have poured in. Even my mother jumped in saying, it's better there together than messing up two separate lives. And don't get me started on the people who mock Lily for wanting a calm weekend, as if she should pay for her own retreat if it's that serious. Everyone seems to agree that these two are a match made in headache heaven, similar to discovering two pieces of trash and understanding they belong together. 
People wonder why they did not start dating right away, instead of bringing people into their turmoil and then pulling a cheating trick. I've also received a lot of encouragement, with notes indicating that I'd be better off without him, and it screwed up that I was made to feel like I'm the one losing it. Tyler tried to play it off as if he and Lily were simply family. That is a whole new level of messed up. Then he had the audacity to try to nab the resort trip for themselves, and everyone pretty much felt he'd lost his mind. The consensus. He might as well have been dating his sister from the beginning. Next story. I cheated by offering one too many chances in roughly half a day. I am going to find out where I stand. Either we're going to shake things up in our marriage or I'm getting divorced. I confronted my husband with a major decision after catching him cheating on me with a female who takes up groceries part-time. We've been a team for a dozen years, so this feels like a punch in the gut. It turns out he's been squandering our money on her. When I put him on the spot, he performed the standard cheater dance. Deny, deflect. When he ran out of steam, the waterworks began with the entire baby. Please update the spiel. So I arranged it for him. We could either open up about our marriage, maintaining the house in a family atmosphere for our children, or call it quits and go our own ways. Going the open marriage option required some strict guidelines. First and foremost, our shared bank account is off-limits for his small exploits. He'll have to use his own stash for that. Our family needs to come first. No exclusions. He is not allowed to bring anyone into our home or around our children. Our friends and relatives are not aware of this situation. No. Dragging them into our mess. Regular health checkups ensure safety. We will keep each other informed about our plans, who, when, and where. But there's no need to trade pictures from our dates if he gets someone else pregnant. That's the last straw for me. On the other hand, if I become pregnant by someone else, I have a few options, none of which entail his playing father to another man's child. He also has the option of filing for divorce, and I would not pursue him for child support. That isn't his. If we do wind up parting, we will do so fairly and squarely. The house is mine by name, so I will keep it. We'll handle everything regarding the kids using a parenting app, ensuring that we do not trash talk each other in front of them. If the kids desire to know what happened, the truth will be revealed. The most important thing is to maintain things cool and collected for them. I simply told my husband, look, you can hang out with whoever you want, but don't expect our kids to be happy and welcoming of them. It is entirely up to our children whether they want to get to know the women he is seeing. I set a timer for him and gave him 48 hours to make a huge decision. Either we try open marriage or we end ourselves divorced. Now we're down to the final 12 hours and it's crunch time. We'll see what he decides, but if he can't figure it out, I'm prepared to take the initiative. And, to be honest, I'm leaning towards just ending everything. So here's the latest. I decided to divorce. I tried to share this before in another location, but it didn't go over well. I didn't even wait the whole 48 hours because I knew he wouldn't choose any of the options I presented. He seemed more interested in dragging this out, convincing me that we could somehow solve things. I'd had enough and urged him to pack up and take the road. He tried to sweet-talk me into selecting the card, which many couples do, but come on. I'm not going to spend another year building on something that has already crumbled. I've already contacted my lawyer, and the divorce papers will be handed to him within a week. I had them ready but waited, hoping he'd make a decision. The entire thing will soon become public, and I'm not here to listen to anyone who tells me to give him another chance. I already did. And he missed his shot. There is no way I'm buying into the idea that cheating strengthens relationships. Spiel. That's just rubbish. Somebody tried to sell me in the comments. I can't take the sight of him anymore. I'm tired of being the one who tries to justify his blunders. That marks the conclusion of that chapter. Now, I'm sitting in a peaceful, empty house. The kids are currently staying with my mother. As for him, I have no idea where he is or what he is doing. But to be honest, even if we fought to keep the marriage open, I knew it was going to end this way. I really didn't want my children to have to claim they grew up in a broken house. But staying in a situation like this would have been worse for them in the long run. So my mother decided to forgive my father once, despite the fact that he had not cheated. But behind it all, I could tell she had lingering misgivings about him. She attempted to act as if everything was fine between them and the others around her. He kept telling her how fantastic she was for standing by him and how their love had grown even stronger after the fright. 
But if you ask me, she never truly got over those suspicions. It's not like my father noticed it. But you could see from her demeanor that she was usually a little apprehensive, keeping one eye open. And when he was out of sight, she'd breathe a sigh of relief, as if she could finally let go of the act for a moment. Man, I'm just spewing my thoughts here. I've been trying to deal by venting my feelings on Reddit and talking to people online. I don't want to wind up in the same situation as my mother, constantly worrying about where my spouse is or whether he's lying to me. When I finally told him we were getting divorced, it felt like I could finally catch my breath, as if I had been carrying around this big backpack full of bricks and had suddenly set it down. Everyone here was correct in presenting him with options. Finally, he had to confront the consequences of his conduct, and by the time I gave him that ultimatum, I was more than ready to leave, and it was clearly the right decision. Reflecting on my mother and father's narrative, I feel like I'm trying to break free from that pattern, accomplishing something she never could. And that thinking gives me a boost. It makes me proud of how I'm managing the upgrade. It's been over a week and a half since I laid everything on the table with him, and I'm completely numb. I uncovered his cheating actions a few months ago, and it took me some time to acquire all of the necessary evidence and get my ducks in a row, including consulting with a divorce attorney. So we're going back seven years, right? When I discover out he's cheating on me, I'm already pregnant. It's a tough thing to swallow. But I opted to forgive him, believing that we might reconcile and go on. For a while, it appeared that everything were returning to normal. I mean, deep down, I knew we couldn't just go back to way things were before, but things seemed doable until I caught him cheating again. That was the final straw for me. I understood that all of my efforts and sacrifices had been in vain, Fast forward to roughly ten days ago. I confront him about this. He employs the standard cheater techniques, denying everything, trying to change the script and making me question myself. At the end of the day, he chooses to leave and go to his parents' house. Meanwhile, he's been blowing up my phone constantly. In his most recent play, he tells me that he severed his relationship with another woman. But at this point, I'm like, so what? Even his mother gets in on the act, calling me up, apologizing, and wondering if I could find it in myself to forgive him and try again. I told her straight up, no way. I'd already played the dice on giving him a second chance, but he just tossed it away. She sounded disappointed, but she didn't pursue it any further. For the time being, the kids are with my mother and stepfather. I've been consulting with my lawyer about my future moves. Yes, I cried a little when he first took off, but not once since. Instead, I've kept myself occupied by going to the mall for some retail therapy, working out at the gym, and spending some quiet time in the library. I even scheduled a session with my therapist to discuss things, but most of the time I've spent at home binge-watching my favorite crime dramas, such as Criminal Minds and Law and & Order. The funny thing is that I'm not sad about any of this, like, at all. Isn't it weird? Why aren't I more upset? If anyone has any insights, I'm all ears. Last story. Am I a jerk for despising my intellectually challenged sister? I'm having a hard time dealing with my thoughts towards my sister, who has severe autism. She needs someone with her at all times. She's unable to speak and has limited self-care capabilities, even though she is just 12 years old. She often breaks stuff, which is quite difficult to cope with. I feel bad, but I can't help but be angry at her since she was born. It's as if I disappeared in my parents' sight. Everything in our family focuses around meeting her needs. I was even moved to the basement as a child because she needed to be closer to our parents. She smashed so many of my stuff, and when I attempted to inform my parents, they didn't seem to hear me. There was even a time when she broke a computer I had from school, and I ended up getting in trouble on top of it all. I'm supposed to always be available to help her, which means I can't get out with friends or do normal things. Children my age do. Even if I do manage to find some alone time, I must abandon any plans. If my parents claim they need my aid with her. If I don't, I'll get penalized. For example, I once went to the movies and switched off my phone. As a result, I was grounded. I feel like I'm just living in her shadow, always expected to prioritize her needs over mine. Just last week, I was scheduled to give a speech at school, something I was quite enthused about. My parents promised to be there, but they didn't show up because of something with my sister. It seems that whenever something vital to me is disregarded in favor of her needs. Today, I couldn't take it anymore. My father joked that I should acquire a decent career in the future so that I can care for my sister. 
and I just broke down. I ended up screaming and shouting about how everything is always about her. It's as if I'm expected to be her caretaker indefinitely, and my own desires and needs are irrelevant. I've been so unhappy that I've only been in my room, and my parents haven't even come to check on me. I'm torn regarding my feelings towards my sister. It's not her fault, yet I can't stop feeling this way. Does this make me a horrible person? Now for an update. Update? Hello everyone, I'm back, exactly as I promised. My initial story received a lot of attention, and since you all appear to care, here's what has been occurring to me. Since that day, I've chosen to take a significant step for myself. I've been staying with my grandfather. The entire experience has been a roller coaster. Some portions are good, but others are tough. Let me lay everything out for you. I told my grandpa everything that happened. Why was I so upset? All of it. He was really taken aback. It turned out that no one else in the family knew about it. My parents had essentially turned me into a full-time caregiver for my sister without any assistance. My grandfather shared several things with me, things I'm not particularly comfortable discussing here. But the ultimate line is that my sister should have received expert care, and my parents were simply disregarding it. He was really disappointed when he found out, especially about the time I missed out on attending a movie due to their expectations of me. He made it plain that I shouldn't deal with my parents without him present. He said he'd chat to them first before we all sat down to talk. But it did not end there. Throughout the week, more relatives contacted me, telling me about things I didn't know, such as how my parents were allegedly receiving money to pay for a caretaker who never existed. To say this week has been stressful is an understatement. Throughout it all, however, my extended family has shown me more support than I've felt in quite some time. My grandfather, in particular, has been amazing in attempting to make up for missed time by encouraging me to spend out with friends and do activities that make me happy. My aunts and uncles have also been there for me. Then there was the confrontation with my parents on Saturday night, and let's just say it did not go well. They conceded a lot but made no apologies. They still behaved as if I owed them my life and time. After that disaster, I realized I couldn't do it anymore. After talking it over with my grandfather and uncle, I decided to leave permanently. I'm heading back there today to pick up my belongings before moving in with my grandfather permanently. Looking ahead, I intend to leave the state for college. My aunt even stated that she would start giving support directly to me instead of my father. My parents have called a few times since then, not to apologize, but to see when I'll be back. I am not. Right now, I'm still rattled up by everything, but I believe I'll make it through. My family has been incredibly supportive. It's painful to think that I've lost my parents, but I've also learned a lot. I've discovered that I don't dislike my sister. I am in love with her. I was wrong to vent my frustrations on her, and I hope to put things right someday. But for the time being, I need to move forward. So that is my update. Let's get to the next story. My fiancé, 30, and I, 28 had a baby daughter five months ago. It was the happiest time in our life, and my fiancé's love for me grew even stronger. Everything is great, but I'm afraid my terrible choices will take it all away from me. My fiancé and I met nearly ten years ago at my 18th birthday celebration. My parents were quite conservative, and they never permitted me to attend or even host parties. I had a relatively normal life with my parents and two sisters. I've been counting down the days until my 18th birthday since I was a little girl, knowing that turning 18 would give me a little more independence. I had a friend named Dana. She was an only child, so she grew up with a lot of independence and a promise to host my birthday party at her house. After much pleading, my parents gave me permission to leave, but only if I took my older sister with me, addressed me, and even lent me her best dress. And the celebration was unlike anything I had ever seen before. But something else attracted my attention. My fiancé, Chris, was the focus of attention at my own birthday celebration. Everyone, including me, thought he was incredibly confident and appealing. I was too shy to say hello to him, but Anna was not. After speaking with Chris, Anna admitted to me that she had a crush on him. I was startled because my friend never had a crush on a guy first. Chris was both charming and snobby, which Anna found appealing. Two weeks after my celebration, I saw Chris in the grocery store. He knew me as the birthday girl. And from there, we started talking. I was very shy at first because I had little experience with boys. But Chris was kind and friendly, making it much easier. Soon enough, Anna, Chris, and I became a trio. 
We accomplished practically everything together. I knew I liked Chris, but I dismissed it because Anna had already expressed her affections for him to me. One year later, Chris and Anna began dating, and I decided to give them space since I didn't want to be a third wheel. Chris and Anna dated for another year, but something happened. Anna informed me that she got intoxicated at a party and cheated on Chris. I kept her secret from him, but Anna cheated on him repeatedly after that. Chris found out one day and their relationship ended. Anna blamed me for their separation, accusing me of telling him. I told her that wasn't true, but she didn't listen. That marked the end of our friendship. Anna eventually moved out of town with her parents while Chris traveled to New York to study law, also enrolled in college soon after that. Four years later, I graduated college and relocated to New York for work. I happened to run into Chris. When he came into the boutique, I worked there for shopping. I was stunned to see him, and I could tell he was as well. We spent hours catching up and discussing life. It seemed like I was dreaming. I couldn't believe I ran across my old crush. I found out Chris was now a lawyer at a very successful firm, name withheld for personal reasons. He earned six figures per month and was quite popular. Chris was from a wealthy family, and his parents were well-known figures. I worked as a clothes designer for a luxury shop, name withheld. Chris would always make time to visit me. After a few months, Chris and I were back to being good friends. After a year of flirting, Chris asked me out, and it was instant. Yes. Our romance grew serious, and we couldn't spend a day apart. Chris's female co-workers envied me since he never hesitated to bring me to his job. Life was good and I was living the life I had always desired. A few months later on my birthday, Chris gave me $500K as a gift. I was overjoyed because the money was more than enough for me to open my own store. One year later, my boutique was now operational, and I had enough money to create five more. Chris was also promoted, and we earned more than enough money to support ourselves. Chris proposed to me a few weeks after his promotion, and I said yes immediately. I couldn't contain my excitement and had to share it on Instagram. Chris purchased a house months later and invited me to move in. My parents wanted to marry us first, but I talked them out of it. I wanted the perfect wedding with Chris, therefore I didn't want to rush things. I had previously met Chris as patents by that point, and they were pleasant. They were also against us moving in together before getting married. Chris told me that his family was quite conventional, exactly like mine. They were strict. After much coaxing, his parents agreed to let us live together. Life with Chris was wonderful, and I fell in love with him every day. He was thoughtful, generous, and very loving. He treated me as if I was the only lady in the universe. When we disagreed, Chris would never raise his voice or try to snap at me. He was always calm and willing to listen to me first. Chris cared for me when I was unwell and occasionally missed work. I cherished every minute with him as if it were the last because I never thought I deserved him. A few months later, we decided to have a baby. After weeks of trying, I became pregnant. Chris was overjoyed, and I could see the enthusiasm in his eyes when I told him the news. He did not allow me to do anything after that. I had a stress-free pregnancy, which was lovely. When I gave birth to my daughter, Chris's love for me grew stronger. Chris was never bothered by my postpartum body insecurities. He took it upon himself to work out with me and restore my confidence. Our kid was the frosting on the cake because we already had a happy life. She multiplied it for us. I shared a series of photos and videos of myself with Chris and our daughter on Instagram. That was the beginning of my issues. I had only 1,000 Instagram followers when I made the posts. I wasn't expecting such a high level of participation. Chris was pretty popular, but I didn't believe anyone would be interested in his personal life. If only I had not made those posts. I would not be in this dilemma. Chris traveled to Italy for work three months after our daughter's birth. He was not going to return for three weeks. Partying with him for so long was difficult for me, but I had no choice. He needed to get to work. He already took many weeks off work when I gave birth to our baby. The first week without Chris was dismal and uninteresting. I tried to concentrate on work and our baby, but none of it seemed to interest me. I knew it would be challenging, but I didn't anticipate it to be so gloomy. Chris spoilt me with his presence so much that I became accustomed to it. Prior to the work trip, the longest we had been apart was three days. Chris contacted me every day, but it simply wasn't enough. I missed and desired everything about him. It was only the first week, yet it already felt like a month. 
One day my personal assistant observed my mood and invited me to a party. I wasn't used to partying, but she said it'd be a good distraction. I told Chris about it and he encouraged me to go. He didn't like how sleepy I appeared when he video called me. I dropped our daughter off at his mother's place before attending the party that night. I wore a black knee-length gown that was not overly exposing. I wasn't seeking for a partner. I already had one I was quite proud of, and I only had one drink at the party because I didn't want to become intoxicated. After two hours, I was eager to return home and snuggle with my daughter. On my way out, I encountered a guy named Roy who was the same height as Chris. He reminded me so much of my girlfriend that I had to do a double take. The only difference was in the eyes and face. Chris was also more muscled than him. Roy surprised me by asking if I wanted to drink. I gently declined, but he insisted. I disliked the idea of a stranger buying me a drink. So I tried to walk away, but Roy muttered something that stopped me. He informed me he was Chris's friend, and Chris had asked him to keep me company. I considered it strange because Chris had never introduced me to Roy before, but Roy claimed he was not based in New York. He even told me a few details about Chris. I believed him because Chris would not speak to anyone unless he knew them well. Roy bought me a drink, and I made the mistake of drinking it. After another drink, I was dizzy and I got a headache. I told Roy I wanted to go home, and he offered to take me there. I dozed off in the car and awoke when Roy tapped me. He told me I was already home. He led me out of the car, but I realized we were somewhere else. I asked Roy where we were at, and he told me his car was faulty and he could not drive it further. I told him I would rather take a cab home and get to my daughter. But Roy said it was already too late for a cab. I thought about it for a while and gave in because I was feeling quite tired and weak. Roy guided me into what I later discovered was his house. I asked him for painkillers for my headache, but he gave me hot milk to drink. That relieved me a little. Roy showed me the room I would be sleeping in, and I thanked him before closing the door. I felt comfortable because I believed he was Chris's friend. I tried calling Chris, but I discovered that my phone was dead. I wanted to take a shower but had no clothes to change into, so I just laid on the bed and tried to get some sleep. Sometime into the night, Roy knocked on the door. I opened the door and found him standing there in just a towel. He was completely shirtless and his hair was wet. For some reason, he styled his hair just like Chris did. He already had an uncanny resemblance to Chris, but now it seemed more defined. I asked Roy what he was looking for, and he told me he just wanted to grab his shirt. After grabbing his shirt, he asked me why I had not taken a shower, and I told him I did not have clothes to change into. To my surprise, he offered me a shirt and insisted I wore it. I still felt a little bit dizzy, so I decided to take a hot bath while I was in the bath. Roy walked in completely naked. I was too stunned to say a word and too tired to move. He just quietly stood there and watched me for a long time. I snapped out of my trance and told him to get out. I kept thinking about Chris and how he would feel if he knew that I saw his friend naked. Roy ignored me, then proceeded to touch himself. He was masturbating in front of me. Imagine how confused I was at that sight. I was drunk, and seeing him do that felt wrong and exciting at the same time. It did not help that I had been sexually starved for over three weeks. Chris was extremely busy for two weeks before his trip. The temptation was too much, and then I found myself touching myself. It was wrong. I should not have done it, but I could not stop. Once I started. The worst part was that Roy and Chris looked almost similar. Soon enough, I thought I was looking at my husband touching himself, and then things escalated. Roy got into the tub with me, and we had sex. The next morning after I woke up with a stranger in bed with me, I knew I had made the biggest mistake of my life. My head felt like it was being stabbed with a knife. It was not just a hangover. I found out that Roy had spiked my drink with some sort of cannabis. The most shocking part is that Roy confessed that he was hired by someone to get me to cheat on my husband. He said his job was done and he left me in the house. I had consented. I knew I had consented because I still remember it all. Yes, he left me. That man drugged me, then ran away. I cheated on my husband. I thought I was having sex with my husband because the drug made the similarities between them more defined. I went back home, and I felt like a cheat. I could not even look at my daughter because I felt so much guilt. Chris treated me like a queen, and I broke his trust. I should not have gone to the party at all. I didn't even have time to think about who hired Roy. I was too depressed to think about myself. 
It's been a week since I cheated on my husband in a week till he'll be back home. I don't know what to do. I've ignored all his calls because I don't have the courage to hear his voice. I don't even know how I'll face him in a week's time. People have read it. I need your advice urgently. It was an accident, but I still cheated. Should I tell him the truth or lie? I cannot live with myself. The guilt is tormenting me. Please tell me what to do. I'm helpless. Update. Hi, everyone. It's been five months and I wanted to tell you all how it's going. Some of you in the comments called me a fool. I deserve it. Immediately, Chris got back. I told him the truth, like most of you suggested. I don't think I had ever seen such disappointment and hurt in his eyes. He stared at me for a long time without saying a word. It felt like I had lost all his respect. After some time, he quietly went to his study and locked the door for hours. It was the most tormenting period of my life. I cried out my eyes, but I never knocked on the door. That would have been very selfish of me. He had every right to be angry, so I let him be. I was ready to accept whatever step he wanted to take. Even if he wanted to leave me, I would not hate him. I brought shame upon myself. I was gullible. Two days after that, Chris forwarded a message to me. In the message, someone sent Chris pictures of me leaving the party with Roy. The person also told Chris what happened. Chris was a lawyer, so he talked to his friends and they traced the message to Anna. Yes, Anna. Anna hired Roy because she wanted to ruin our relationship. I was so angry that I searched for Roy with the help of Chris. And then he led us to Anna when we threatened to take him to the authorities. When we finally met Anna and demanded answers, she accused me of taking Chris away from her. She felt like I told Chris she cheated years back, so she wanted to pay me back by setting me up. Roy had switched off my phone, and Anna was the one who told him personal things about Chris. So I would believe him. Apparently, she had seen all my Instagram posts with Chris and got jealous. There was nothing I could do because I had fallen into her trap. I got home that day feeling defeated, but what was more shocking was that Chris asked for a break. He moved out of the house and we did not speak for two months. I lived a miserable life in those two months, but my daughter made it better. After two months, Chris finally forgave me, and he told me he loved me so much he could not lose me. I was shocked, happy, and grateful because I never thought he'd come back. Now we got married two months later with our daughter as the little bride. She could hardly walk, LOL. My life is back to being beautiful and I have my husband by my side. I hope my story inspires someone and makes them more self-aware. I was lucky to have a husband that was ready to forgive me. Thank you to everyone that commented and advised me to tell my husband the truth. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't. Nothing is ever as it seems, and I think I'm the perfect definition of that. I don't even think there'll be a single person in my comment section who's going to be on my side. I'm doing something that I know no one will support, but I just can't stop. I've come this far to get something, and I don't want to lose the opportunity to have it. Maybe I'm the perfect definition of what people call a gold digger, and I think I'll not stop being one anytime soon. I'm desperate. And that's what made me get married to my husband in the first place. My name is Michelle, and I'm a 31-year-old woman who works at a fashion store. I live in Los Angeles, California, and I only moved here after getting married to my husband. I am married to Simon, a 40-year-old realtor agent, and we have been married for approximately two years now. I come from a very poor background, and I have struggled to feed my whole life. Nothing ever came to me without paying a price. And that's how I landed a realtor agent as a husband. I sound like a fool, and to be honest, I think I am one. But if being a fool would make me survive in this cruel world, there's nothing I'll not do to survive. I didn't just meet Simon and get married to him. I literally had to pay a price to be with him. It's like the same situation with how I've struggled in life. It's a trade-by-barter situation. I'm not claiming to be a good person because I know that I am far from it. I am an opportunist who has tried her best to climb her way up. There's nothing good and innocent about me. When I first met Simon, he had a girlfriend. I just met him because he came to the town where I used to live with some of his friends on a camping trip. I know one of the people who works close to the place they visited to camp, so it was very easy for me to meet him. I didn't attend college by then. I was supposed to have finished college, but I was still a high school graduate who worked several jobs to earn. When I heard that a group of rich guys were visiting, I decided to grab the opportunity. What better way to get rich than marry rich? I didn't even pay attention to Simon at first because he was the least attractive of all the guys present. He had a dorky look with unkempt beards. He is also the oldest of the group, so I never wanted to go for him. 
One of his friends looked quite attractive, so I decided to go after him. I started visiting the camping site almost every day, but none of them seemed to notice me. I also discovered that they were all married, except Simon. I wasn't surprised because he wasn't someone I'd go for on a regular day, but I was desperate and decided to make a move. Long story short, I was able to befriend him and get his phone number. Unfortunately, they went back to L.A. almost one week later. I still had his phone number, but I was no longer interested till I was told that he is a realtor agent. That made me more determined and I started calling him every day. I still have a lot to say, so I'll cut the story short. He hooked a flight for me after two months of talking online, and then I visited him in Los Angeles. We started dating for a while, and then I introduced him to my brothers. After he followed me back to my town, like I said, he's 40 years old and seemed desperate to get married. After just six months of dating, he proposed after meeting my whole family. I agreed on the condition that he found me a job in New York. He agreed and also gave me a condition before we had any children. He said we could only have children after we lasted four years of marriage. I didn't get why he wanted that, but I agreed. Because like I said, I was desperate. One weird thing Simon did before we got married is that he made sure I took several tests to determine my blood group genotype and other medical terminologies I cannot seem to call. I know it's normal to test with each other, but his tests were extreme. But like I said, I had no choice than to marry the old man. I'm not even sure he's 40. Maybe he's lying about his age. He looks 50. After getting married to Simon, I realized that the grass is not really greener on the other side. He'd met my whole family and had his opinions about all of them before marrying me. But I only met his sisters and uncles at the wedding. I didn't see his parents. I asked why, and he just told me that I shouldn't worry about it. Well, I realized that Simon and his parents are not on good terms, and all the aggressions seem to be thrown on me. Two years ago, I was just a 29-year-old woman who just wanted to settle down. I wasn't ready for the burden of a family rivalry, but I had no choice because I was practically thrown into it. How would I describe Simon as a husband? Terrible. He has to be the worst husband any woman should want. That man is very selfish and self-centered. When I married him, I thought I'd be able to get a life of comfort and luxury, but I'm not getting any of that. He has the money, but he just chooses not to spend it. The only thing he has done for me since we got married is find me the job I asked for. I began to get extremely desperate because I just had limited resources. I realized that he just married me so his parents would stop taunting him with his single life. I also wondered why he didn't marry some of his colleagues, but I've realized that it's because he wanted a girl like me who would agree to do anything just because of his title, a realtor agent. Like I said, I didn't graduate from college. In fact, I never even went to college. Simon is aware of that because I told him a miserable life story in the hopes that it would make him have compassion for me and marry me faster. Well, he did marry me, but not out of compassion. He married me because he wanted an uneducated wife like me that could sign her rights for money. Simon is out there living his life and traveling because he is in, quote, a realtor agent. We hardly sleep together because he wants to make sure I don't get pregnant. I used to wonder why he didn't like the idea of me getting pregnant, but I recently realized that it's because he doesn't want me to have a child with him, now and then divorce him before asking for child support and spousal support. That's why he made it clear that I must not get pregnant till we lasted four years of marriage. He wants to stay married to Simon for four years. Me? I'm not ready to stay married to that man for four good years. I know he might divorce me after four years. His parents are another torn in my flesh. They keep asking me why I don't have a college degree and why I'm not pregnant yet. Sometimes his mother even asks me if her son hired me to be his wife. Let's get back to my so-called husband, Simon. That man has played with my intelligence and I know it. The job he got for me is all I have. He doesn't listen to me when I ask for money. He just gives me a couple of dollars. And then that's all, nothing else. So much for marrying a realtor agent. What's the difference? I got tired, and I knew that I had to do something fast. I told myself that there was nowhere in this life or next that I will let myself stay married to Simon for four years without having anything to show for it. If there are more good-looking men out there, and I could have gotten married to them, but I chose him for a reason, and that's why I refused to take a back seat. 
I might not be a college graduate, but I believe that my instincts and intuition would take me far. Simon never ceases an opportunity to tell me how I would have never gotten a job if he didn't make his friend hire me without a college degree. I'm ready to show that man that I'll do something so great that even a multiple degree holder like him would never beat me. Update wow. I don't think I've ever seen so much hate in a comment section like I'm seeing in mine. What did I do wrong? I'm an opportunist and I didn't deny that. I also didn't come here and pretend like I was a saint that fell from the sky. I know I'm wrong in certain things, but so is Simon. He's also an opportunist and a very greedy one at that. Why else would he get married to a high school graduate and then tell her he doesn't want children? We're both in the wrong boat together. The only difference is that I'm the one at the receiving end of it. Thankfully, few people supported my ideology, even though they didn't agree to some of the things I said. It's all fine. And I believe that one way or another, I'll be able to get to the finish line without support. If I want to get out of the marriage with something substantial, having a child is important, but so far Simon has not wavered in his decision to not have children yet. I know he cheats on me because he is hardly ever home, and when it's time for us to get together, he uses protection a lot. He also gives me the pills immediately. I'm tired of the same routine, and I don't want him to outsmart me. I'm ready to have a child. And even though it's not going to be for Simon, so be it. That was the decision I made before I realized that there was every possibility that Simon would find out I had a child for another man. He's smart, and I know there's no way he'd not try to get a DNA test as soon as the child is born. I just decided to have fun and see where that takes me. I was tired of sitting around the house, only to be disturbed by his parents and interviewed on every single topic. While he lives his life under the pretext of work, I don't care if he's actually working. I'm tired of working once in a while and doing things continuously in a boring routine. I'm going to start pretending like I'm no longer a married woman because I need to have options left for when Simon suddenly wakes up and decides to divorce me. I don't want to go back to a life of striving. I've asked Simon to put me into college, but he's not ready to do that. He keeps coming up with several stupid excuses and I am just tired. Nobody has time for that. And I'm certainly not going to trust a selfish man like him with my life. There's no way that's going to be possible update. Hi guys, it's time for an update lol. I almost feel like I'm running a reality TV show because of how much information about my life that I'm putting out here. I guess I can't fault myself for asking advice and seeking the opinion of other people. Trust me when I say this, except a person was drunk or drugged. Cheating is a conscious decision, and it's something that's usually planned for months before its actual action. How do I know this? Well, I'm currently using myself as the test subject in this case, and I now understand a lot of things. I want to cheat on my husband. It's intentional, and I want to do it because Simon is one of the people who is making my life very difficult. Now that man has tried his best to tie me down. I don't want to live that kind of life. I thought he'd put me into college the moment I accepted to marry him. I also want to go to school and be educated. If he is not ready to do that for me, shouldn't I look elsewhere? He married me with ulterior motives, just like I married him with ulterior motives. The both of us are to blame. But I don't think he even knows that yet. Just yesterday, he came back from work and he looked very tired like the dutiful wife Jay was forced to become. I prepared something for him to eat because most of the people in the comment section tried their best to make me look like a bad person. I decided that it would be nice if I tested Simon one more time. Deep down, I knew nothing would change. But I was easy to try just because I wanted to prove you all wrong. Long story short, I asked him about enrolling me in college all over again. I know that he had the money, and I can bet a lot of things that he doesn't need to break his bank to send me to college. Why then did he want to limit the amount of things he gave me? Well, I realized that his reason for doing that is because he doesn't want to give me enough things so that I would not end up running away. Maybe he is aware that I might end up leaving him at the end of the day. So he is trying to make sure that he doesn't spend too much or risk too much. I'm sure that the both of us are playing a very risky game, and I just hope that neither of us is ready to back down. After talking to him and getting disappointed yesterday, I decided to make the conscious decision to just go straight to the point and do what I've always wanted to do. There's a person at my workplace that's trying to flirt with me, but I've never given that person a second look. One of my reasons for doing that is because that person is also my colleague at work. Why would I want to date my colleague? 
We earn the same thing and both of us are trying to survive. Why would I want to risk everything by dating someone like that? I wasn't ready to have that kind of conversation yet, so I decided that it was best to be wise. I wanted to make sure that whatever I'm risking my marriage for is better than my marriage. My marriage is already a sham. And to be honest, I've wanted out of this marriage for months. I want to divorce Simon and go back to my town, because the only thing he has given me is a job and a roof over my head. Those are the only reasonable things he has given me all through the marriage. If I leave him today, there would be no difference because I had no idea I was getting married to a very stingy man. If I had known then, I would not have made the mistake of getting married to him. I'm the first place now about the person at my workplace. I think it's also risky because I could get caught if I am not careful. Simon gave me that job through his friend who knows the owner of the fashion store. There's every possibility that he has been trying to keep an eye on me, and it would be really unfortunate if I let myself right into his trap. That would give him a reason to divorce me without a single thought, and I don't want that yet. I'm only holding on to the marriage because I want to make sure that I didn't waste the past two years of my life. I don't want a situation where I'll end up leaving the marriage broke. It would make me really upset if I leave the marriage without anything at the end of the day. I didn't marry a realtor agent that was about nine years older than me just to be treated like crap. That was not in my bingo card at all. That's why I'm making sure that I calculate my every love and never fall into a trap. It would be unfortunate for me to realize that in the process of trying to outsmart Simon, I ended up putting myself in everything I've endured at risk. I would hate myself for that, and I don't want that at all. So, I'm just here, guys. I'm waiting for that rich man that would finally get interested in me. I don't plan on waiting forever because my patience is very low, and I don't want to waste my life away. That's it for today, guys. I'll see you all in a while. Update your favorite gold digger is back again, just like you all like to address me in the comments section. Many people think I'm this big gold digger with no brain at all. Well, I don't actually blame the people calling me that because it was I myself that called myself a gold digger in the first place. I'm now getting called several names. It's not like I never expected it, but wow. People can be extremely rude when they want to. It's the way they don't even care about my feelings or how I ended up feeling at the end of the day. Well, I guess my feelings aren't valid as long as I'm a gold digger LOL. Before moving on, I just want to say that the comments have been cracking me up quite literally. It's been insane. So life with Simon has been the same and there's been no change at all. I knew that I'd be a fool to think that a man as smart as him would suddenly try to act all sweet and stuff. I think the past few days have revealed to me that Simon is actually a very intelligent man. I think he is aware that he married a woman that only looked at him twice because of his job and money. He knows that. And I guess that's one of the reasons he's making sure that we don't have a child till we're a year or two, last two more years. If not for my desperation back then, I would have never actually married him because I didn't know that I was signing up for this. I expected more from him and I thought that I'd caught a big fish, lol. So Simon traveled just two days ago for one of his job trips. He's a realtor agent, so he naturally has to travel to do his work. Before, I used to get quite angry that he always traveled and left me at home before we got married. I asked him if his job required him to travel a lot, and he denied it. In fact, he told me that he wouldn't even travel up to ten times a year. He played me in that regard because now I know that he travels up to ten times a month. And I don't get why he never told me that ahead of time. But when he traveled this time, I was actually very happy because I'd been hoping he'd travel and just leave me at home when he left and had a glass of champagne to celebrate. Because any time he was at the house, I literally had to trample on eggshells and act like a whole different person because I didn't want to raise any suspicions. My brothers came to L.A. last week and they've been asking to see me, but I kept telling them that I was not in town. The main reason I did that was because I didn't want them to see Simon, not because I want them to hate him, but because I know Simon doesn't care for any of them. He made that clear even before we got married. He clearly told me that he feels like my brothers are lazy and that they just spend all their time at the camping site doing nothing serious. I didn't say anything to him because I knew that he had no clue what kind of work my brothers have done just to survive. 
It's easy for a person like him with so much money to think that life is just all about traveling as a realtor agent. My brothers were the ones taking care of me for a very long time, even though they didn't attend college to. Our parents didn't have money to send us to college, so we just lived life like that. At some point in our lives, we were the ones that began to provide for our parents. Do I hold any grudges? Not at all because I know that they tried the best to provide for us. It's just that life isn't easy for everybody. I know that Simon would not hesitate to try say something that would bring my brothers down mentally, and that's why I think it's best that they avoid each other. I didn't want Simon anywhere near my brothers, and I don't want my brothers anywhere near Simon. I feel like life would be extremely easier if we just followed this protocol. So I met up with my brothers today, and we talked a lot. I asked why they were in L.A., and they just told me that it was for some work. I was happy to know that my brothers were doing well for themselves. They had to live today, so our conversations were quite short. They picked up on my mood, even though I tried to smile all through. I just lied and told them I was having period cramps. They knew nothing about that, so they believed me. When I got back home, I decided that it was best to update you all first before I made my next move. One of my brother's friends in L.A. invited me to his house party, and I actually plan on going. What do you guys think? I know this is the perfect opportunity to meet people and do. I'm really interested in grabbing the opportunity. I'm not going to update fast. Like, like I've been going because I think it's best to just update you all at once. I'll update as soon as I can, but it's not going to be as fast as the rest. Update. I cheated on my husband, guys, and now I think I might be pregnant. Yes, you all read that, right? Where do I even start from? And how do I begin to explain my predicament to you guys? It's been hectic and quite confusing, especially for me. I thought things would be easier and I would not take myself by surprise, since I'm the one actually planning everything. And it's not a freestyle, but I think I underestimated how fast things could change in the blink of an eye. It's actually very crazy, and I can't wait to tell you all my predicament right now. So I went to the party I was invited to, just like I told you guys. I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to do something crazy, so I didn't think twice before doing what I wanted to do. The party was not what I expected at all. I thought it was going to be a wild house party with several drinks and an unhealthy amount of snacks. Well, it wasn't that way at all, and it really surprised me. I think one of the reasons I was so gassed up for that party I had because it was one of my brother's friends that invited me, and I knew him from our town before. He was quite wild and very dramatic, so I expected his party to get that way. But unfortunately for me, that was not the case at all. I think it's fair to say that I got the shock of my life when I realized that his part was quite classy and sophisticated. I was not impressed at all because I wasn't really interested in a party that didn't have crazy drinks and an enormous amount of food. I wanted to let loose and just travel back in time to the days when I used to party with my brothers in our town. It was really fun and I missed those parties. Since I came to L.A., there were no more parties like that. I could attend. Simon was like a watchdog that fell from the sky just to keep an eye on me. Anyways, I still wanted to have fun at the party so I didn't let anything make me stop. I didn't see the person that invited me for some time so I just decided to look around and take a look at things for myself. That was just what I wanted to do at the beginning. But something stalking happened, and I actually met a guy that looked like money. When I tell you all, he looked like money. I'm not exaggerating. His suit and everything he wore screamed money, but I didn't quite understand why a guy like that would want to wear a suit to a house party. I mean, who wants to wear a suit to a house party? Is that even normal at all? Well, I guess it is, because he was not the only one I spotted in a suit. They all looked like people knew what they were doing with their lives. The music was very slow, and I think it was opera music that was playing in the background. It was nothing extra like that kind of music that just makes your eardrum throb. It was at that moment that I figured out that I was probably at a party for rich men. I became curious because I wanted to ask the person that invited me how he knew so many rich people. When I finally saw him and I asked him the question that had been eating me up, he just told me that he had gotten a job that pays well after he moved to L.A., and that's how he got to buy a house. He also told me that most of the people present were his colleagues at work. That was what finally put me at ease because I'd been worried that he was running some kind of scam LOL. The guy I told you all about didn't interact with other people much. He just stood at one place sipping champagne and looking at some of the artworks on the wall. I approached and engaged him in a conversation. 
I was very nervous at first because I didn't want to end up embarrassing myself in front of so many people. That's why I initially tried to see if I could just start a random conversation without causing commotion. It actually worked. And then we started talking. At first I started flirting with him, then pretended like it was the fault of the wine I had in hand. We spoke for a long time, and at some point we exchanged contacts. I took a lot of wine and the little alcohol available because I needed that drunk courage. It had been a long while since I tried doing what I had been doing at the party, so I was very anxious at first. At the end of the day, we left the party together. My brother's friend actually pulled me to the side to ask me why I was going out of the party room with a guy. He was aware of the fact that I am married, so he wanted to know what I was thinking. I just told him that it was nothing serious and that I'd speak to him another time. I could tell that he was really worried and he offered to call my brothers, but I refused. He left me alone after that. And then I went back to meet the guy. We went to a hotel that night and we spent the night together. I didn't expect to feel the level of guilt I felt the next morning. I guess I'm human after all and I had to feel some type of way. We did use protection that night and I was sure of it because I saw it in the bin. Me and that guy saw each other very frequently after that and we hooked up a lot. I don't want to call his name for personal reasons. He gave me gifts and even offered to find a job for me. At that point... He didn't even know I was married at all. Simon seemed to spend forever on his trip, so I used that opportunity to hang out with the guy I met at the party. There were some times when he wouldn't use protection, but I didn't think that if suddenly just got pregnant. I always imagined that people had to actually put in effort and try before getting pregnant. I just realized that's not true and that every woman has a different body type. I suspect that I might be pregnant because I didn't see my monthly flow this month. Simon just got back yesterday and I'm really scared. I don't know what to do at all because this isn't in my bingo card. What do I say to Simon? And what do I say to the guy I'm pregnant? For what? He believed that the baby I'm carrying is his when he finds out that I'm married. Help me, guys. I haven't taken a pregnancy test yet, so I'm not 100% sure, but I'm still scared. I haven't missed my menstrual flow like this ever before, and it makes sense that I'm pregnant. That's the only reasonable explanation I think I'm really done for at this point. Update. Well, my fears have proven to be reality, and I am now left with nothing. Even after all the things I tried to do to make sure that I didn't end up like I ended up, now I still got what many people think I deserved. I took the pregnancy test because I was actually very scared, and I wanted to know the truth as soon as possible. The tests revealed that I was pregnant. I still went to the hospital to check, and I was proved to be pregnant. I had to go back home and think of what to do. I decided to go tell my affair partner first. He was surprised that I was pregnant, and he was also surprised that I was married. He accused me of trying to trap him with another woman's pregnancy, and then he broke things off with me. Yes, he literally told me it was over and that he never wanted to see me again. I almost fainted and gave up, but I had to tell myself that I couldn't just let something like that weigh me down. I left his place after getting rejected. He didn't even listen to me after I begged him continuously. Jared just sent me away, just like that. And I had no choice than to leave. I went home and I gave Simon the pregnancy test results. I told him I was pregnant and then he laughed straight into my face. He told me there was no way that was possible. And I asked him how he could be so sure. I consistently told him that I was pregnant, and yet he told me I had to be lying or he was not the father. I didn't even try to back down. I refused to back down and let him win. I challenged him and asked him to prove why he was not the father. When I was married to him and we slept together like couples did, he told me he always used protection. I asked him why that gave him so much assurance when protection was not 100% reliable sometimes, and there was a possibility of the protection tearing up. I called him a simp for thinking he could bully me into rejecting a pregnancy. That was his. I said he had to be stupid if he thought he could deny the pregnancy. I called him all sorts of names and I said he wasn't even man enough to accept his own child and that he was scared of taking responsibility. That was the first time I raised my voice at him and it was initially because I had a lot of pent-up anger and wanted to vent. I thought those harsh words would soften him up and make him accept the pregnancy, but instead I was shocked by his reply. He told me that the pregnancy couldn't be his because he had gotten a vasectomy long ago and that he did so because he didn't want me to come up with stories that were fake. I was very surprised. And it was at that moment that I realized that I had been caught red-handed and there was really no going back. 
I should have pinned the pregnancy on him when I knew just how smart he was. I asked him why he always used protection when he knew he had a vasectomy, and then he told me he wanted to have two backups. That same day he sent me out of the house and I was served with divorce papers. Two weeks later I signed it without a second thought because I knew that there was no way I could drag it out. The divorce can only be finalized after I give birth, and he's proven to not be the father. His parental rights would be revoked and he will not need to pay for child support. That's just how smart Simon is. Update. I can't believe it's almost been a year already since I was busy pregnant. I didn't have a lot of time to process things. I gave birth two months ago to a baby girl and the DNA tests were conducted. He was proven to not be the father and his parental rights were revoked. He doesn't owe me child support anymore. Even after everything I did, I was still left with nothing in the long run. I tried looking for my affair partner again, but he has made it impossible to reach him. I'm now a broke single mother with two mouths to feed. Karma did hit me hard, and Simon left me with nothing. The only money I have now is the money from the savings I got from the fashion store. I got fired, by the way. Simon made sure he didn't let me go just like that. I guess the gold digger is now left with no gold to dig. I feel like I got what was coming for me. There's no way I can pin this on another person, even though I hold some grudges. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you loved the story, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share regarding your own or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.